Uh, all right, there we are. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Had, a, had some momentary electronics problems. So let's. How's everybody doing today? Oh, we're doing well. What do you think for a background? Should we go with this? Do you prefer Claflin or do you prefer just a black background? Ah, uh, the black is looking awful. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Um, so I was able to send out a lot of uh, responses last night to um, your videos. I really enjoy um, watching them. Uh, one thing I want to see everybody do is start to create more professional videos. Um, and when you do these for class, think about opportunities where you might want to show them to other people in the future. Okay. Because you're going to be working in this, in this space for, for the rest of your careers, um, hopefully. Um, and so being able to put out um, a video that can connect with folks and explain different topics, that's something that's really important to be able to do, especially um, as climate advocates and um, people who really want to make a difference. Um, so uh, from time to time, I'll put out tips on how to do these. I can do one-on-one -on -one videos or Zooms with you to kind of show you how to edit these things. Um, I find sometimes the easiest way to make a video is just to bring up Zoom, you know, and start um, and, and just start a Zoom and then record it to my computer. And I just, you know, you hit, you know, start recording and then um, go ahead and give your talk. You can share the screen. And so you can have your PowerPoint up and you can be talking through your PowerPoint, et cetera. Um, and then when you end it, it will write it to a file and then you could video edit that file if you need to, or you could just use that file as, as it is. You can upload it to YouTube. You can upload it to uh, Flipgrid, any of those things, um, uh, or any kind of social media that you want to. You can make TikTok videos that way. Um, so if you've got uh, PowerPoint, that's an easy thing to do for these kinds of presentations. If you don't have PowerPoint, you can get it. Our school offers it to all of our students. So um, I can give you the links on how to download all of Office 360 if you don't have Word or PowerPoint or any of those things. And so that's free for you to use. Um, and it's part of your tuition that you've paid. Um, so with that said, um, any questions on style or any of the things that I mentioned in uh, my response videos? Yes, Prof. Um, I think I really want to know the exact amount of uh, I think CO2 in the biosphere. Ah, um, okay. <laughs> sure, sure. Let me pull this up. Let me, uh, got a bunch of these. Hold on a second. Uh, where it is? Uh, this was on uh, carbon cycling. And we'll the bottom here. Oh, that's not what you want to see. I want to come see this. And besides that, so uh, this is kind of like my master slide, um, and I can send this all out to you. <laughs> so in the atmosphere, right, when we talk to these large numbers, they are estimates, right? So they can vary a little bit, but around 840 gigatons of carbon. Um, in the land biosphere, if you're talking above ground, so this is mostly trees and plants and organisms, um, we're talking about 650 
gigatons. Um, so a little bit less than what's in the atmosphere. Uh, below the ground, however, this is stuff that's buried, worms, you know, roots, all that kind of stuff. Um, we're looking at uh, uh, about 2,400 gigatons. So it's a huge amount. Okay. Um, if you look at the ocean, we have about 900 gigatons in the mixed layer. Remember, that's the first 100 meters. Um, and then below that, the rest of the deep ocean, about 45,000 gigatons of carbon. So that kind of dwarfs all of the numbers we've talked about with the land biosphere and the atmosphere. And then lastly, what dwarfs all of those things um, is probably the rock reservoir. So if you just look at carbon inside the earth, right? Uh, deep inside the earth in rocks, et cetera, we're talking over a hundred million gigatons. Okay. So big amounts. Now, when you talk about the amount of carbon going from the atmosphere to the land biosphere for photosynthesis, that's about 120 gigatons per year. Okay. Um, and for respiration, it's about an equivalent amount back, right? So we were kind of in balance from the atmosphere to land biosphere, 120 out, 120 in. So it kind of stays stable. Same thing with um, going from the atmosphere to the oceans. You're probably doing about three gigatons a year. So significantly less than respiration or than photosynthesis and respiration. You're probably dissolving about three gigatons per year. And um, similarly, the oceans are degassing about the same amount, about three gigatons a year. So again, that would keep the atmosphere stable somewhere around eight, 840 gigatons. Now, if one was more than the other, then you'd, you'd, if, you'd, if it wasn't equal in versus going out, then you'd start either building up if you had more going in and coming out, you'd have a buildup. If you had more going out than coming in, you'd, you'd eventually lose all the carbon out of that reservoir. Um, so I've tried to include as, <laughs> as many numbers as I could. The amount of material that's getting compressed into the rock reservoir from the land biosphere is around 0.2 gigatons per year. Um, amount of... In Chemical weathering is probably about 0.2 gigs, uh, gigatons per year. And um, organic uh, material from under the deep ocean being compressed into the rocks, again, is 0.1 to 0.2 gigatons a year. So all of those add up larger than the amount that the rock reservoir is giving up to the atmosphere in the form of volcanic eruptions, which is about 0.1 gigatons per year. So we would expect to see carbon slowly building up in our rock reservoir. But this is over millions and millions and millions of years. And uh, it looks like, you know, we're funneling a lot of that out through the burning of fossil fuels at uh, 10 gigatons per year. If that answers your question, does that answer your question, Lori? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. 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 So um, I will make sure you all get a copy of this particular one because um, I like it. It's helpful. Okay. So where are we today? We were still talking about the free market, and now we're going to be talking about free market responses. So remember, our goal is we need to move to carbon zero, right? We're pumping 10 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere every year. That's far too much. Um, it's what's causing our current warming. Uh, we need to switch to these renewables now. And the big question is, how do we get everybody to do it? Why, why are we having the problem in the first place? We talked last time about the concepts of externalities where the actual true costs of something aren't factored into the price, right? And that can be really, really problematic um, because it means we're not making logical, sensible choices because we're not considering the full costs of things that we buy. You know, it's like, imagine if you 
if you went to the supermarket and every time you bought something, there was this additional cost, which you were going to owe the supermarket, you know, a couple dollars next year and the next year after that and have to keep paying for it. So you come home with all these groceries and then in a year you find you're saddled with all these debts you didn't know about. Because eventually, one way or another, you're going to have to pay for these costs. If that makes sense. Um, let me... Okay. Um, so we talked about externalities. Um, these are costs that aren't factored into the price. We talked about this this simple example of um, widgets, saying that okay, if the cost to manufacture a widget to the manufacturer was ninety cents, um, imagine in making this widget, you had to use energy, you had to turn on the lights, you had to run some machines. So if our energy is coming from fossil fuels, that means greenhouse gases are emitted. And that has a cost too, right? These are costs in you know, property damage due to increased storms, property damage due to flooding, increased healthcare costs because of um, you know, additional diseases and emerging diseases, or um, uh, it's warmer now, so mosquitoes can fly further and um, transmit more malaria, um, or it drives up the cost of food because less food is being produced because of the effects of droughts, et cetera. So these are all costs that are out there that we're not paying when we buy the widget, right? So the total cost to society really for this widget is a dollar, okay? And if you sell a million widgets, that's great for the manufacturer. They make a lot of money, but society gets the bill for 100000 in climate damages, which are going to be shared by all of us, okay? So you're going to end up paying paying that cost, but you didn't get to choose when you went to go buy the widget, you know, oh, I was only paying 90 cents for it. I didn't plan on paying 10% extra. Um, so let's take an example of, you know, we can extend this, this um, uh, example to say there's a new method now, a new method which um, is relying more on renewable energy. OK, so in the old method, the cost of the manufacturer to make it was 90 uh, 90 cents. The externality was um, 10 cents and the total cost society for the widget was a dollar. And the new method, the cost to the manufacturer is a little bit higher, right, because they had to buy some new stuff. Maybe the cost of that renewable energy is a little bit more. Um, but in this case, there's zero dollars in externality fees, right? Because you're not paying for the greenhouse gas effects. And so the total cost to society is actually less um, for this new method. So the new method is definitely better for society, right? So will the manufacturer now switch to this because it's better for society? Is that what manufacturers do? Better option, but I don't. Some it don't do. It seems mm -hmm. nice, but that um, mm -hmm. remember manufacturers the way the way our system is set yeah, up. Of course. Go ahead. You know, hello, proof. The manufacturer will maintain the cost method because he is incurring more costs now on right. his side. So it's good to the society. Right. He's going to say, look, I got kids to feed. I need to make as much money as I can. I'm going to go with the lowest cost thing so I can sell the most. So this method is the new method is better for society for not, but not the manufacturer. So they're not going to try and do it. So, um, you know, it's, it's easy to see how this works. You know, if the old method was relying on coal and the new method is relying on wind, wind's more expensive, manufacturers are not going to choose the wind energy because of it, right? 
Um, you know, fossil fuel energy may appear cheaper, but that's only because consumers don't pay the full full price, right? There's lots of these other costs to these fossil fuels um, that are going to be pushed onto society. Um, and that's part of the reason why we're not seeing the shift to renewables, because we're not seeing the full cost when we make our decisions. Okay. And this tells us why we really need some kind of intervention into the system because the system is broken right now. It's what they call in economics a market failure. So um, <clears throat> uh, we know that this new method is better for society. Um, so how do we get past that? Our solution has to be to make the manufacturer pay for the full cost of production, right? And that's where government intervention can comes into. Um, uh, you could tax the manufacturer so we could choose the new method, right? And this way you internalize the externality. So now, instead of saying, okay, well that, that fee is gonna be paid by society, we're gonna actually charge the manufacturer for those external costs that nobody sees. And now the total cost to manufacturer is a dollar, right? Because you're adding in those, that 10 cents of externalities. Now they're gonna choose the new method because the old method has a bigger cost to society, okay? Um, so this is where the idea of a carbon tax comes from, where you make polluters pay a fee for every ton of carbon that they're going to emit, okay? Um, and to understand how this works, I've kind of put together this little thing. Um, so with this carbon tax, the idea is you want to get folks to reduce their carbon um, by imposing this tax. So imagine a manufacturing plant that emits a lot of carbon, okay? and they plan to reduce their emission of carbon. Um, and for the first ton of carbon that they wanna reduce, it's fairly easy. There's not much they have to do. We say the marginal cost of reduction to reduce that ton of carbon, let's say it's just a dollar. But the second ton of carbon, there's more, they have to do more um, changes to their plant, fix more pipes, do whatever. And so that, cost is going to be a little bit more for that second ton of carbon, okay? So the total cost of reducing these two, uh, two tons would be the cost of the first ton and the cost of removing that second ton. So um, you add up what we call the marginal costs of reduction, okay? And generally, marginal costs of reduction get larger the more you want to re reduce because it gets harder and harder, the more you want to uh, reduce your emissions. Um, but our total cost here is um, of reducing the um, total of two units is $3. Dollar for the first one, $2 for the second one. And it's important to remember that the marginal costs are the costs of an additional unit of reduction. And the total cost is always the sum of all the marginal costs uh, up to that point. And so let's take a look at this company, okay? Um, here's the first ton, the marginal cost for what it would take to reduce one ton of, uh, of carbon. Um, and you see as the number of tons reduced goes up, total number of tons, it costs more for each additional ton, right? The first few are easy, but the marginal costs are always gonna increase as the size of the reduction um, increases, okay? So when does, under this schema, say we're gonna try and do a carbon tax, and we're gonna, because we wanna try and include the cost of carbon, um, its effects on society. We want to internalize that externality. And so, you know, we come up with, well, society is paying a price of about $4 per ton of CO2 emitted. 
So at what point, if, if this is what the manufacturer is looking at for their marginal cost of reduction, at what point do, um, does the manufacturer reduce to? How many tons of carbon will they uh, reduce from their production? Okay, so good. That since it's not clear to everyone, we'll walk through it. That's why we do this. So let's go mm -hmm. through for the it's first okay. ton. Okay, the the manufacturer can either pay a dollar to reduce one ton because that's their marginal mm -hmm. cost of reduction, or they can get taxed four dollars to admit that ton. So which will they pick? Will they reduce the ton or um, pay to admit that ton? Desire, you're on mute. Uh, reduce. So they'll reduce, okay. So let's go to the second ton. So we're gonna reduce this ton. We go to the second ton. They can pay $2 to reduce one more ton or they can pay $4. What are they gonna do? Rather, rather reduce. Right. It's pretty simple. It's not rocket science, right? Um, when you get to three tons, do you want to pay $3 to reduce an additional ton or pay $4 to admit that ton? It's a kind of a no brainer. You save more money if you just reduce. So the tricky point when you get is when you get to um, uh, the next one where you can pay $4 to reduce one more ton or pay $4 to emit that ton. So the manufacturer is kind of equivocal, right? Um, it can either pay $4 to reduce or pay $4 to emit. It's the same cost to them either way. And generally what we see in society um, when folks do that is that um, they usually opt to go with the better solution that's better for society because it's good publicity. So since they got to spend $4 anyways, they'll usually do the reduction. At least that's what we've seen so far. What about when you get to the next ton? Are you going to pay $5 to reduce one more ton or pay $4 to emit that ton? Pay uh, $5. Right. You're going to pay the $4 to emit the ton because it's cheaper to do it that way. So really, in the next after that, once the cost of reduction or a, once the tax has uh, or the marginal cost of reduction has exceeded the price of the tax. Then they stop. Um, doing their reductions. And so with this carbon tax, one of the things people like about it is it's a free market solution, right? It doesn't tell anyone what to do. They still have choices, right? Each emitter will pick the level of emissions that maximizes their own profits. And emitters will keep reducing emissions until that marginal cost of reduction equals the carbon tax, okay? Better way to put it, and this is what I want you to remember for exams, remember for the course, emitters will reduce emissions until the marginal cost of reduction equals the carbon tax. Okay, that's as far as they'll go. Once the cost exceeds the carbon tax, they're gonna stop, stop reducing their emissions. Does that make sense to everyone? So immediately know if you do a carbon tax, whatever amount you set for that carbon tax, you know is going to um, uh, is going to be the price point when they're looking at their marginal reduction costs. That's going to be it's going to set it immediately. You don't have to walk through every step of the table. You can just say, oh, it's going to go until the costs are equal. When they're equal, they'll generally side for the reduction, but not always. But once 
the marginal tax is uh, the marginal cost of reduction is higher than the tax, then they're just going to pay the tax. Okay. Um, and so it's nice that it's a free market solution, allows people to make choices. It also has another effect, which in the long run makes it cheaper. And I'll show you why. So imagine we have um, uh, two plants, two um, production facilities. They can be in the same industry. They could be in different industries. Could be completely different. It really doesn't matter. The point is, say you have plant A and plant B, okay? Um, and we're going to compare them. How much are they going to, is each plant going to reduce their emissions? So for plant A, if we have a carbon tax of $4 per ton, how far will they reduce their emissions? For plant A. Four tons, okay. And what about for plant B? Eight dollars. Eight dollars? Why eight dollars? If they go up to here, why would they? If it, why would they pay eight dollars to reduce their emissions by four tons? when they just need to pay $4 for that additional ton. So because how, of maintenance repairs of uh, having a, a efficient equipment, that is the cost that make it more higher. Well, so for reducing the first ton, Plant B can pay $2 to reduce that ton, or they can pay $4 in a tax. So they'll pay the $2 to reduce the ton. To reduce the next ton, so the total of two tons, they'd have to pay $4 um, to reduce that or pay $4 in tax. Well, they're equal, so they'll probably go ahead and do the reduction. But once it gets higher for that third ton, they're going to have to pay an additional six dollars to um, uh, to reduce that ton, or they could just pay four dollars with the tax. So they'll probably just pay four dollars with the tax. So they'd stop right here. Our emissions for Plant B stops here. Our emissions for Plant A goes all the way here. Does everybody follow along with that? Mm. Okay, they reduce until the marginal cost of reduction exceeds the tax. When the um, marginal cost of reduction exceeds the tax, they stop. Okay, so plant A is going to reduce by a total of four tons, and plant B is only going to reduce um, by two tons. And so by having this tax, our total reduction across the industries is a reduction of six tons four from plant A and two from plant B. Everybody following along with that? Okay. What's the total cost to the plants? What's the total cost to plant A? Remember our total cost is the sum of the marginal costs. So for plant A, $1 plus $2 plus $3 plus $4, right? Took $1 for the first ton, another $2 to do reductions for the second ton, another $3 of improvements to get that additional ton, and then another $4 of improvements to get that final ton. Um, so a total of 10. How about for plant B? What was the amount? And I heard six, right? So two plus four is six. Remember, they stopped here. They chose not to pay these, right? Because um, they'll do the tax instead. Okay. So here, not everyone chooses to pay the same, right? One company pays a lot more for reductions. 
another one um, uh, pays less for reductions. Okay, mm -hmm. so each emitter, um, so so our total cost for this was sixteen dollars. Now let's compare this to what would happen if we did a conventional regulation. Okay, conventional regulation <laughs> says that everybody is subject to the same. Um, uh, everybody is subject to the same reduction. Okay. So that means they pass a law and says, everybody's got to reduce their carbon emissions by three tons, okay? And so plant A um, has to reduce by three tons. So does plant B. How much do they pay to do that? What are their total costs under these conventional regulations? We're no longer taxing the carbon. We're just saying you got to reduce by three. Everybody does. How much does plant A pay? So if it's by three, it's one plus two plus three for plant A, which is six. Then for yep. plant B, it's two plus four plus six. So that's yep. good. So now uh, they're subject to the same reduction, but folks don't pay um, equally. What are the total costs? Okay together so six plus 12 is 18 right before it was our cost before were 16 so the total cost to all the manufacturers combined is more expensive under conventional regulations than reducing emissions under a carbon tax right because some people if you're forced to go to a certain amount may have very expensive um, marginal reduction costs, okay? Um, <clears throat> so with conventional regulations, um, each emitter is subject to the same reduction, um, but we've seen a carbon tax is cheaper because emissions um, reductions are always shifted to the lower marginal cost emitter. The person with the lowest marginal um, costs are the ones that do the uh, the most reductions because it's easier for them to do. So it reduces, reduces emissions at a total lower cost um, than conventional regulations, which is why a lot of folks really like this idea of doing a carbon tax. Um, now, well, some folks will say, well, yeah, but the carbon tax raises the cost of energy. What do you guys think about that argument? And doesn't this raise everybody's costs by doing this? We're going to have to pay more. So who would want to do it? What do you think? Should we do a carbon tax? Or do you think that they're right in that you're... Um, so I do not think it really raises the cost of energy in the, in the context of how it's put, because of course there's a certain uh, amount of money that is being paid towards um, the damage that is being caused by the production. So in that in that aspect, no. So when yeah. you buy, sorry? No, go uh, ahead, go ahead, keep going. You're, uh, I okay, totally okay. agree. So, so in, in the case that, uh, let's just, let me use the example that you, you, you gave us earlier. Mm -hmm. With the carbon tax, it kind of affects us in uh, externalization, making it though it looks like it it's um, the cost of energy has been raised, but in the context of it having um, taken into consideration the total amount of damage, I don't think it raises the cost of energy. Mm -hmm. Other people have thoughts. Do other people agree? Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, Prof, I think it, it doesn't because in other ways, when once the mission is done, we we definitely have to pay for it. So everyone right. has a part to play, so it doesn't increase the price. Right. We're all going to pay for those damages one way or another, right? Yeah. Whether it's increases in, um, in taxes because of um, damages that are done in the country, or you know, perhaps you lose your own house because of flooding. And so you're going to pay the cost. And without it, the externality being internalized into the system, we're never making smart choices, right? Those costs are just going to be imposed on society by having a carbon tax. This way you pay the full cost of your actions and you can choose which actions you want to pay for and what their cost is. And in that way, it will tend to get producers to reduce their emissions because now they're accountable for some of the damage that they're doing. Um, so why, do, why, why don't we have a carbon tax already? If this is such a great idea, who in the world would oppose this? I don't know. I think Glory and Desire are totally sold on this. So uh, if they were running the country, we'd be doing it. Why? Why? Why aren't our countries doing this? <laughs> uh, I think. Well, no. in as much as it it is a good idea, the implementation of it will would require. A cooperation from Actually, all because countries. The government policy is also not supporting it well. <laughs> well, why don't they support it? Seems like it's good for the country. So why don't they? Okay. <sighs> One thing that's important to know about um, about carbon taxes. Um, although they incorporate the externality into the system, um, not everybody um, pays an equal amount, right? Um, there are some people that are going to lose out on the system, right? Like coal, man coal producers, for example, coal miners. They're going to lose their jobs if um, we switch to renewable energies. The companies that make their money off of coal are not going to make money anymore if we switch away from coal. There's going to be no market for them. Same thing with oil companies. So fossil fuel producers who tend to have a lot of money because we buy a lot of fossil fuels have a lot of influence. And so we'll see opposition from those folks. You also see op uh, opposition from uh, libertarian groups that oppose any kind of government intervention in any case. They don't like the government being involved, in which case they would just always say no because it's the government doing something and they don't like the word tax. Oh, we don't want to raise taxes. Nobody likes to run on raising taxes when they're a politician. And so that makes, you know, it makes it more difficult, but it doesn't really raise the cost of cost to people because we're still paying for our cost of energy, whether it's through paying for climate damage or paying the extra 10 cents or 20 cents on a gallon of gas. Um, either way, it's coming out of your pocket. And, and this way, it allows the free market to go back to um, Adam Smith's idea in The Wealth of Nations is that society could still be served best with people acting in their own self-interest because they tend to like to do that anyways. Um, and it's a way of rounding out the system. So remember this all goes back to um, that IPAC relationship. When we talked about how do we get the impact to zero, you know, the impacts in our society from climate change. And remember the one thing that we saw that we could reduce to zero 
is our carbon intensity, right? And so carbon intensity is related to carbon emissions. So if we can bring carbon emissions down close to zero, then we'll be okay. And one free market solution to doing that is this idea of the carbon tax. We'll explore some others like car cap and trade, um, but these are kind of like big economic ideas to solve to solve our current problem. You got a question, Desire? Yes, I wanted to ask. So, in the in the event, let's say a country um, implements this idea, but they they get their the most source of um, energy through like fossil fuel, for example, thermal. Would mm -hmm. it not push the cost of electricity a bit higher by the, well, of course, the producers of electricity? They've been factored out that they are paying tax. Um, so say their cost because of the tax means now their costs are raised to $10 per unit. If the cost of the renewable source of energy is $9 of units, then it doesn't raise the price of energy because now you can buy energy at $9, right? So it'll raise the price until it equals the cost of the renewables, right? And then people will just start buying the renewables. But that's just the cost of the electricity. You're still paying the cost to the damage. You're just not doing it when you're paying your electricity bill. You're paying that cost when you know, you're having to rebuild your house due to flooding or uh, take care of those damages. So it might be 10 years down the line, but you're going to pay all those costs added up either way. Was that the cost of the electricity? Well, not for what you had to pay to the electric company, but certainly that electricity coming from fossil fuels certainly cost you. It cost you your home 10 years down the line. So um, yes, you can say it raises the price of the electricity, but remember the costs of renewables are gonna be your cap. If that source of energy is cheaper, then people are gonna switch to it. And so it won't go up that high. And as um, technology progresses, hopefully those costs of renewables will continue to keep coming down. We've seen a dramatic decrease in the price of renewable energy over the last decade, actually over the last two decades. Um, as uh, wind turbines become more efficient and cheaper to produce, um, as battery technology um, becomes cheaper to produce and increases in its ability. It gets rid of that intermittency problem, which again, you know, helps the price point for those uh, renewables, et cetera. So we hope that the renewable costs will keep coming down. There's probably a floor to that, but we're certainly gonna continue to pay higher and higher prices the more we burn those fossil fuels. Does that answer your question, Desire? Yes, it does answer. Um, I was thinking of those countries that would be lagging behind in terms of um, improving when it comes to energy, like energy production, like having to implement clean sources of energy because we are not all gonna level up at the same pace. There are those right. countries that will be ahead and those that will lag. Right. And remember, as we discussed, you know, in a few lectures back, um, affluence certainly affects what you can afford in terms of these reductions, right? More affluent countries can go ahead and shell out the money for a new nuclear reactor or a huge wind farm or, you know, a solar farm. Um, some of these other countries where fossil fuel energy is really cheap, they don't have the money to purchase these big farms, to make that investment. And that's gonna be something that as a world, we need to come together and you know, give grants and give monies to help countries that uh, uh, 
don't have the affluence to to make those transitions. Um, you know, if, if you recall some of our um, the SSP uh, projections, SSP one, SSP two. Remember, um, I think it was SSP three, um, or maybe it was SSP five that uh, had um, a big disparity in wealth. And that was SSP five, a huge disparity in wealth. And the huge disparity in wealth drives us up in terms of emissions and drives up the temperature. So it was pretty clear from those SSPs and from the IPAT relationship that part of the solution to climate change is making sure that the world is more equitable. A non-equitable world leads to more emissions and a warmer climate. And, and, and one thing I love about this class is I think for every single one of you, you're all all really concerned about the moral aspect of climate change and the responsibilities that come along with it, not just for yourselves, but you know, for everyone. And I think that's great. Okay, I think we made it to 1150. Um, thank you for your time. Um, and now we won't have class on Wednesday or Friday. So I'll see you next Monday. Um, cause we have our, we have a holiday, um, starting Wednesday. So school is out. Enjoy yourselves. Uh, keep reading the book if you want. Um, but have a good time, blow off some steam and we're going to be heading into close to the final week. I think, um, classes end on December 1st. Um, and then we go into finals. And then we could discuss, we'll discuss next week how we want to set up the finals and stuff. Um, and I'll probably have um, uh, another um, peer teaching. I would love to get some, I mean, I got a gazillion ideas based on what we talked about um, in terms of a topic for the next peer teaching. But if there's a topic that you all think you'd like to cover, could be stuff that we've covered or tangential to it. Um, let me know, um, but by next week, I'll come up with one. Do you guys like doing the flip grids? Do you like doing the peer teachings? Yes, they're quite interesting, and I think it helps you refresh your mind that you actually know it. it's fine. Yeah, fine. yeah I, I think it's good on, on the retention stuff. What I'm really looking forward to is... By the end of um, the program, you're all hopefully going to be excellent presenters and very professional speakers and very professional advocates for um, the kinds of things that you want to do in your next step after your master's degree. I want to make sure you're positioned perfectly for that. Okay, thanks, everybody. Need, need the link for the electronic connection. Okay. Okay. Talk to you later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.